Europe series of debates. It has been over one year since Russia launched its full-scale military invasion of independent and sovereign Ukraine and to a democratic Belarus. Dear colleagues, we have already witnessed our union becoming stronger and more resilient. Facing these challenges together has made us more united. And in this time of global instability, we need to speed up investment in Europe to put our economy back on a stable path of growth. President, your push for a long-term competitiveness strat strategy, an ambitious trade policy, and boosting conditions for investment has been central to this vision of a better, more prosperous Europe. Dear President, the floor is yours. Madam President of the European Parliament, honourable, honourable members of the European Parliament, dear fellow Europeans, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to contribute to this inspiring debate here in the European Parliament, the most important political forum for addressing fundamental issues about the past, the present and the future of a united Europe. I would like to dedicate my speech today to the idea of Europe, Europe that unites us and gives us strength in the face of multiple crises. Today, I'll talk about the need to be resolute in the pursuit of our goals and to stand up for what we, Europeans, treasure and value most. I will talk about supporting Ukraine, about Ukraine's place in Europe, about the importance of remembering our past and uh, uh, the grave challenges Europe is facing today. I come here just a few days after Lithuania celebrated the restoration of its independence. What I'm about to say has been defined, at least in part, by Lithuania's perspective, shaped in the long course of history on the east shore of the Baltic Sea where different cultures interacted, competed and enriched one another over the centuries. Although clashes between powerful forces of history often led to painful tragedies, they also engraved in our hearts and minds the enduring value of freedom and human dignity. It is symbolic that 700 years ago, the ruler of Lithuania, Gediminas, sent out letters to his European contemporaries, inviting foreign knights, merchants, craftsmen, farmers, priests and monks to come to Lithuania, where he promised to, uh, that they'll be able to practice their Christian faith fe uh, freely and to build a better life. It is this date, the 25th of January, 1323, that marks the beginning of the history of our capital, Vilnius. But just as important is that the letters of Gediminas have anchored in our political memory the vision of Lithuania as an open, tolerant and progressive European nation, the ideal that we are determined to pursue. Indeed, Lithuania has always been an integral part of Europe, and even when we face the most terrible ordeals, occupations and terror, we have cherished this vital bond. During the long, dark hours of occupation, our hope was kept alive by the strong belief that sooner or later we would return to the community of independent European nations, the community that's based on freedom, responsibility and trust. It was this belief that on 23rd of August 1989 inspired me and more, almost two million other people in Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia to join hands in protest against the illegal Soviet occupation and the Stalin-Hitler pact. We formed a 650-kilometer human chain, which we called the Baltic Way. And this was the beginning of our march towards liberation and, at the same time, towards our return to the European fold and reopening to the world. 
Today, I can see the same spirit that made the Baltic Way possible manifest itself in Ukraine's struggle for freedom, independence and its democratic European future. Vladimir Zelensky, the President of Ukraine and, and my dear friend, at the European Parliament a month ago that Russia is seeking to destroy not only Ukraine, but the European way of life, to destroy by violence and lies all of us who cherish freedom, honor and dignity, who respect the rule of law and human rights. We cannot allow this to happen if we really care about the future of Europe. We must take a stand and show by our actions what is truly precious and valuable for, to us. This is a moment of historical breakthrough, similar to the one Lithuania experienced in January 1991, when the defenders of our freedom stood barehanded against Soviet tanks, armed only by boundless courage. Today, Ukraine is going through an even more painful experience as it defends itself against the bloody murderers of Bucha, Irpin, and Izium. I am happy that Europe and other freedom-loving nations did not succumb to the lies, disinformation, and intimidation spread by Russia. We stood united and extended a helping hand to Ukrainians when they needed it the most. After overcoming some doubts, we are now moving forward with more determination, strength and resilience than ever before. A united European response would not have been possible without the strong support and determination of European civil society. It is no coincidence that a month ago, President Zelensky addressed first of all Europeans all European citizens. I believe that today most European citizens understand that Ukraine's fight is their fight uh, too. In this fight, victory can only be achieved through the uh, uh, joint efforts of all, us all. I'm proud to say that as soon as the war started, it was not only the Lithuanian authorities, but also our civil society that responded to Ukraine's call for help. Lithuania's assistance to Ukraine, including that provided by NGOs, businesses and individuals, stands now at nearly 1.5% of our GDP. In May last year, just in three days, Lithuanians raised six million euros to buy a combat drone and this February 14 million euros for tactical radars. Lithuania stands ready to continue supporting Ukraine with great hope we look upon the members of the European Parliament because we remember that you showed leadership on many an occasion when circumstances required Europe to take a bold, clear and unequivocal stance. We do remember that 40 years ago, on the 13th of January 1983, the European Parliament adopted a resolution on the situation in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania that condemned the Soviet occupation of the Baltic states. Back then, the European Parliament was the only international institution to react to an appeal for help signed by 45 dissidents from Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. Eight years later, immediately after the bloody massacres took place in the Baltic states with the Kremlin's tacit approval, the European Parliament clearly designated the actions of the Soviet army as military aggression and intervention. I would like to thank the European Parliament in particular for their unwavering support to Lithuanian prosecutors and judges who investigated the bloody events of the 13th of San uh, January 1991 as they faced pressure and prosecution by Russia because they did their duty. Your support was of great significance as it is the truth that Russian aggression targets first. Russia's long-lasting campaign of spreading lies and distorting history sets the stage for its attack on Ukraine. Therefore, we first and foremost must stand up to lies. Up to lies. 
Ladies and gentlemen, today we're all paying a heavy price for failing to learn the le lessons of the Second World War. Back then, as we rejoiced having overcome one totalitarian Nazi regime, we overlooked and passed over in silence the, si the crimes of another totalitarian regime, the Soviet regime. The fact that these crimes went unpunished allowed the Soviet Union and later Russia to glorify perpetrators of war crimes, ethnic cleansing and other crimes against humanity. The distorted memory of the Second World War was eventually instrumentalized in Russia and beyond to justify the atrocities committed today. If we want to avoid repeating previous mistakes, we must remember them. That's why the European Parliament's resolution adep adopted on to, on twen in 2009 on Europe's conscience and totalitarianism as well as its decision to mark the 23rd of August, the day, when, the day when Stalin and Hitler signed their criminal pact, as the European Day of Remembrance for victims of all totalitarian and authoritarian regimes have special rev relevance in today's context. Last July, in order to counter Russia's hostile behavior in the context of its aggression against Ukraine, together with Estonian, Latvian, Polish and Romanian leaders, we called for a stronger EU focus on European collective memory when designing educational programs for school children, as well as providing EU funding to investigate and evaluate the crimes of communist regimes at international level, as well as the creation of a European memorial to the victims of totalitarian regimes, regimes in Brussels. I believe that all these measures would create a link between the painful past and the present in the minds of European citizens, thus leaving less room for Russian propaganda. Ignoring the past is never a good idea. That's why in Lithuania we realize that remembering the crimes committed by the two totalitarian regimes and their collabor collaborators makes us stronger and more resilient. It sharpens our resolve and vision when facing off today's challenges. I'll be frank. The first reports uh, about the atrocities in Bucha and other places in Ukraine were particularly painful to the people of Lithuania as they brought back memories of many butchers that happened in our country in 1944 and later on when the Soviet occupiers brutally imposed their illegitimate rule where they mutilated the bodies of slaughtered freedom fighters and arrested mothers who dared cry over the bodies of their killed children. It's deeply distressing that this unspeakable terror has returned to Europe. This makes it all the more, more important to ensure that Russia's most recent crimes do not go unpunished. Unexposed evil kept in silence year after year not only poses a constant threat to fundamental European values, but also prevents the Russian people from confronting their own past. We must therefore break this cycle of lies and glorification of criminals and blatant aggression before it crushes us all. It is not only the fate of Ukraine and its people that depends on it, but also any prospect of a lasting and sustainable peace in Europe. We must strengthen sanctions against Russia till it stops its brutal war against Ukraine. And we need to ensure that those responsible for the crimes of aggression are held accountable. I therefore strongly support the establishment of a special international tribunal to invest investigate the crimes of aggression and the use of Russia's frozen assets to rebuild Ukraine. I believe that the resolution on the establishment of a special tribunal adopted by the European Parliament in January will help achieve what just recently seemed hardly possible. Ladies and gentlemen, the European community, which was created as a project for peace, is under unprecedented pressure today. We feel more and more acutely that peace, freedom, democracy and prosperity can no longer be taken for granted. History shows that the most effective way to expand the space of peace, stability and prosperity in Europe has been and will continue to be further enlargement of the European Union. The successful EU enlargements in 2004, to, uh, 2007 and 2013 are testimony to that. The newcomers, wishing for a stronger Europe, are enthusiastic about reforms. Today too, if we want to make the European Union stronger, let's embrace 
new members. With this in mind, I warmly welcome the recent historic decisions on Ukraine, Moldova and the Western Balkan countries. Today, Moldova needs our assistance more than ever as it faces enormous political and energy pressure from pro-Russian forces. We must also give hope to Georgia's young generation and civil society as they actively seek change and a European future. No doubt, thinking out of the box will be called for during Ukraine's accession negotiations. But Ukraine has already demonstrated that it's capable of overcoming every obstacle and staying firmly on course for reform. Just recently, hardly anyone could believe that Ukraine could be granted candidate status as the war keeps raging on. Sparked by the Euromaidan, Ukraine's revival must eventually reach its ultimate destination in a united Europe. It's not only Ukraine that needs Europe. Europe, too, needs Ukraine, with its vibrant energy and its resolve to make uh, the impossible possible. That's why I dream of the day when uh, members of the European Parliament elected in Ukraine will sit in this chamber and the Ukrainian flag will fly alongside the national flags of other member states in, the f in front of this building. <laughs> the same flag that has become a symbol of Ukraine's heroic, heroic struggle for dignity and freedom. Lithuania has heeded the call of the European Parliament to mobilize efforts and launch negotiations with Ukraine before the end of this year. It's therefore crucial to ensure continued EU financial and technical support for Ukraine's European reforms. Of the Baltic Way in Europe. We truly wish to contribute to Europe's global leadership. We aspire to build a world that is fair and just for all, a world that we will hand over to future generations in good conscience. It is no secret that among the greatest challenges facing Europe today is maintaining a dignified and independent stance in its relation vis-à-vis -vis authoritarian regimes. Those who want to weaken Europe undermine its democracy and the foundations of the single market. I'm convinced, however, that we must remember that together with our closest partners, we have been, we are, and we will be incredibly strong. Therefore, if we are serious about maintaining the rules-based international order, we must not only take on the responsibility ourselves, but also continue to deepen and expand the transatlantic relations. We must fully cooperate with like-minded countries in strengthening democracy, developing rules-based global economic relations and promoting fair competition. We must counter economic coercion. The issue of irregular migration certainly deserves our joint focus. The need to agree on legal measures to combat illeg illegitimate migration and its political instrumentalization has become even more pronounced since Lithuania and other neighboring EU countries became the target of a hybrid attack by the Belarusian and Russian regimes in 2021. As national and local authorities confront increasing pressure, solutions are needed at the EU level. Lithuania fully understands the need to properly secure EU external borders. We therefore support the targeted use of EU funds, smooth return of irregular migrants, stronger focus on countering disinformation in third countries, and combating human smuggling and eliminating the root causes of illegitimate migration in, country, in its countries of origin. We need to look at the European Council and discuss an important issue there. The preparation for Europe's Green Deal and ensuring the competitiveness of our economy. There is a group of 10 heads of state and government to which I belong and we have written a letter asking for a long-term strategy 
on Europe's competitiveness. For us, that involves strengthening the internal market, the technological and industrial basis, and the bringing down of barriers for goods, services, and private capital, as well as the promotion of international partnerships and clear rules for trade. We need to focus on Africa, Latin America, India, and the Pacific. I also want to say a few words about the Critical Raw Materials Act, which was put forward by the European Commission this week. These legal acts will make a contribution to the green and digital transformation. So these acts will further drive these transitions and will make the European economy and industry more resilient. Russia's coercion in the area of energy have made it apparent that the European Union is in a place to be resilient and to make decisions swiftly. Winter came and winter passed and nobody in Europe froze to death. However, there's been a hike in energy prices which of course has affected the economy as a whole as well as politics. We need to draw conclusions and invest even more in green energy so that we can become truly independent. And what's even more important is that we protect our planet's climate. Nach meiner Überzeugung ist die I firmly believe that Lithuania's decision to forego Russian oil, gas and electricity is an example, an example which other European Union countries could follow. We are very concerned that Russia is using nuclear as a coercive tool. What's happening in Zaporizhia is a constant threat, could constantly black out. This power plant, the biggest nuclear plant in Europe, was cut off from electricity because of Russian rackets. I want to thank the European Parliament for its full support as we seek to prevent any further problems with the power plant in Astrolitz in Belarus. And I hope that this support will not go away. The danger is still there. No, in fact, uh, the danger isn't going away. It's even getting worse because Belarus is planning to connect a second power plant to the network, to the grid. We can't allow a second Chernobyl to happen. ...of the European Parliament. To conclude and set the tone for today's debate, I would like to remind you that United Europe was born on the ruins of World War II. We have seen time and again serious crises give impetus to European renewal. There is something remarkable about the ability of all of us Europeans to adjust and move forward with unfaltering optimism whatever happens. Our recent trials have once again led to reasonably fast, precise and accurate decisions. Each time we confronted a migration crisis, a pandemic or Russian aggression, we made the right choices. And most of the time we chose more Europe, which means quicker decisions, more decisive action and more resilience. I can assure you that Lithuania will always work to be at the forefront of European decisions. This is our commitment, not only to Europe, but also to ourselves. We know better than anyone else that the risk of losing Europe means we are making every effort Europe, uh, to keep Europe strong and resilient. 
We feel it is our duty to extend symbolically the Baltic way so that the whole of Europe can share the spirit of responsibility that 33 years ago united people between Vilnius, Riga and Tallinn. It is a task of many generations of Europeans, not just a single one, to contribute to shaping the future of Europe. We all can and must work for more freedom, security and progress. We all have the responsibility to ensure that freedom-loving nations in our neighborhood are not neglected, wronged or forgotten. This is the Europe I believe in and I am proud of. Let us be the co-creators of such a Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Nauseda. Uh, I will now give uh, the floor to representatives of the different political groups, uh, starting with the EPP group, Andrius Kubilius. Your Excellency, Mr. President, dear colleagues, I would like to welcome the President of my country in this House, which in the European Union has the strongest institutional adherence to European values of democracy, human rights, liberty, solidarity, and respect to dignity of each human being, despite what is his or her color of the skin and what is his or her sexual or political orientation. The European Union will be strong if it will be based on those values without compromises. If it will be based on those values not only here in the European Parliament or in some other EU institutions, but also on a national, regional and local level. This is the only way how those values can be established also on the whole European continent. Why it is so important to talk about those basic principles and values? Because this is the only way how sustainable peace can be established on the European continent since here is very well known law of geopolitics. Only democracies are not fighting with each other. That is why defense of those values everywhere in our Union and spread of democracy and basic human values into the eastern side of the European continent is the most important strategic geopolitical goal for all of us and especially during this war. We need to recognize all of us in the European Union who are not perfect back home in this area. There are things which we need to improve and to strengthen, also in Lithuania. But today I want to elaborate on what our President was speaking about. What should be our common strategic agenda in order to assist the nations in the eastern part of the European continent to enjoy the same European values of democracy and human rights? I want to repeat, sustainable peace on the European continent will be established only when Belarusian and Russian people will have a possibility to enjoy those values and to live in a normal European conditions. Such a strategic agenda will be implemented only if we shall proceed with a very clear strategic action plan. First, Ukraine needs to decisively defeat Putin's Russia during this year, and that will, be, and that will create possibilities for big political changes in Russia and Belarus. Our most important obligation, weapons, 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 and sanctions. Second, absolute geopolitical priority for EU during this year to start membership negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova. That would be most powerful European geopolitical answer to Kremlin hybrid offensive activities in the region, especially in Moldova and perhaps also in Georgia. Third, integration of Ukraine, Moldova and possibly Georgia towards EU should be concluded till the end of this decade, since that is the only way how successful and prosperous democracies can be created in those countries. Success of those countries would be an inspiration for Belarus and Russian societies to follow. Fourth, Ukraine needs to get membership in NATO, if not during Vilnius summit this year, then during Washington summit next year. It would help Russian people to abandon their dream to restore empire, because Ukraine will be gone. And fifth, EU needs to show clear perspective. Democratic Belarus will have possibility to integrate into EU. Democratic Russia will have special and very practical relationship with the EU. We, Lithuanians, want to be part of European Union, which is able to implement such a democracy action plan, because this is an action plan for sustainable peace on the European continent. Thank you very much, Mr. Kubilius. And now on behalf of the S&D group, Vilia Blinkevich-Jute. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Respublikos prezidentė, pone pirminį. Mr. President, Madam President, dear colleagues, fellow European citizens who are following our debate, Lithuania, like other countries of the same fate, which were destined to experience the aggression oppression of Soviet totalitarian Russia, knows better than anyone the price of the freedom won with blood. Today in this place is Ukraine, which is fighting heroically for it and our freedom. It is fighting the same aggressor, just with a different name. It is therefore not surprising that from the very first of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and up until now, the voice of Lithuania and other Baltic states has been the loudest, calling for urgent full assistance to Ukraine, also demanding a united response from the European Union in order to stop Russia's aggression here and now. Let me remind you that for years, Lithuania and other Baltic countries have constantly spoken out, warned about the true face of Russia and the aims of its authoritarian Putin regime. Unfortunately, not all members of the European community wanted to hear these warnings. However, these warnings have turned into a bloody reality for the Ukrainian people. Today, everyone has recognized that uh, Lithuanian Baltic talks about the, the bloody aims of the Kremlin regime was not just an outpouring of historical grievances. We did it because we knew how fragile freedom is and how great the cost is. And we wanted to make sure that this does not happen in Europe again, that no nation suffers brutal oppression and assault on its territorial integrity and freedom ever. I fully agree with the president. Historical memory must not lie in the archives. History must not be forgotten. And the war launched by Putin is proof of this once again. I therefore call for our responsibility, unit and courage, and for the establishment of a tribunal for war crimes committed by Russia, for all possible sanctions and actions to weaken the power of Kremlin's regime in order for Ukraine to win this brutal war, because that is a guarantee of Europe's long-term security. We must be united rebuilding and expanding our defense capabilities. Our security as Europeans will depend on how we work together in a focused way to achieve this. Colleagues, a strongly resilient Europe can only be a Europe that is united, socially responsible, just and progressive. Our aim as socialists and democrats is to strengthen the social foundations of Europe to ensure that the objectives adopted at the port summit are fully implemented in all member states. A social Europe must ensure that even people with minimum income are able to live with dignity and support their families, not end up in poverty, that we don't have any more poor children of whom we still have over 18 million today that men and women receive equal pay for the same work, that our pensioners, especially single women pensioners, have dignified old age and the rights of freedoms of all people are protected. Only a socially strong, resilient, responsible Europe will be able to cope with major challenges such as green tra transition, digitalization, which is inevitable inevitably will have impact on Europe's social economic model and labor market. Our people must be at the front of all reforms. Let's be brave and united for Europe. Half of the Renew Europe group, uh, Jordi Canyas. Thank you very much indeed, President. On many occasions in Europe, I think we forget about geography. And sometimes we look at geography excessively and we talk in terms of north, south, east and west. Sometimes we divide Europe according to levels of GDP. But sometimes reality dawns and gives us a reality check and we therefore have to look at the real significance of a country, the stature of a country. And this is something I think which has happened recently. We look at Lithuania and we see that it is a great country. It is a country which has led the way in terms of its position on Ukraine. It has been exemplary in its response, in its solidarity, in its commitment, in its support, and not only verbally, not only in what it has said, but equally in what it has done. In its approach, it has really moved the global community to give support to Ukraine, but it has given resources, both financial and 
human resources. And it has welcomed many, many refugees. It has shown that it is a great country. It's one of the big leading countries because it has also set an example which takes it way beyond the level of its comparative GDP in European terms, which is only less than 1% of Europe's GDP. So now when we see at Lithuania, we see what Europe is. It is commitment and it is solidarity. That is what is Europe. And what is Europe? Europe is your country, Lithuania. Because at the moment of the greatest of difficulty, at the most huge of challenges, your citizens, your government, your leaders have shown us what the real true European values are, what Europe stands for, what it represents. And it is a place of refuge. It is a cradle of democracy, but it is equally a place where democracy is supported with commitment, with generosity, with solidarity, but with more, even with arms if it is necessary, because it has got to be defended to the hilt, even in the trenches, if necessary. And we have learnt this from you, from your exemplary response, and we have learnt, thanks to you, that we have got to defend rights, we've got to defend people, because it is certain that Russia is a threat, it is a military and a strategic threat, and you have been saying this for years, and we failed to take this on board. We didn't realise what being dependent on energy from Russia was. We didn't realise the reality, despite the fact that the smaller countries who knew this were telling us this time and time again. So you have shown leadership, and I want to thank you for that and for everything else you have done. Thank you for being here. Please pass on to your citizens the huge gratitude of all this Parliament and of the citizens of the whole of Europe for the commitment, the solidarity, the generosity and the fantastic example which the wonderful leading country of, Europe, of uh, Lithuania has provided for us. Thank you. Next, uh, the co-president of the Green Group, Terry Reintke. Thank you, Madam President. And first of all, welcome to the European Parliament, Mr. President. And most importantly, even if we are a bit late, a happy Independence Restoration Day uh, to Lithuania, of course. More than anything, colleagues, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine has confirmed the need for European unity. And it is true. Only together as Europeans, we can stand up against the brutal imperialism of the Russian regime. And we have shown here in the European Parliament that we stand for unwavering solidarity with Ukraine, be it financial, humanitarian, military support, paving the way for Ukraine to become a member of the European Union. But of course, and you have mentioned it, Mr. President, the full energy independence of the brutal Russian regime. And for too long, politicians, also and especially from my home country, Germany, have ignored the alerts for, from our eastern neighbors, like, for example, Lithuania. And now we are paying a high price for this. But colleagues, one thing has to be understood. Simply switching from one energy dependency on one dictatorship to another will not solve any of our problems, nor does a shift from one fossil fuel dependency to another non-renewable energy source. The only sustainable answer that will prevent us from having the exact same problem that we have been facing in the last year, again in two, five or ten years, is to make our energy consumption 100% renewable. And that is possible. And we have no time to lose. No country in the European Union will manage this alone. Only a strong European Green Deal can make that possible. And you are absolutely right. The Green Deal for, for, for long already has not only been a measure that we need to protect our climate or to stimulate our economy, it has become the most crucial measure also for strong security in the European continent. But, Mr. President, the fight against authoritarianism does not only happen, unfortunately, outside of the European Union. We also have to stay vigilant inside because we can see attempts of undermining our democracy, of undermining separation of powers, rule of law and fundamental rights in the European Union. Brutal attacks on press freedom and journalists. And we cannot stay silent in the European Union on these developments. 
because the EU is not only a community of trade. We share fundamental values. And if we want the EU to be strong and true to its own values, we have to protect all our citizens from these attacks. No matter whether they are from Lithuania or Portugal, no matter their gender, their skin color, or their sexual orientation. Because safeguarding freedom and human dignity means safeguarding freedom and human dignity for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Reinske, now on behalf of uh, the ECR group, Valdemar Tomaszewski. Pani mm, Przewodnicząca. President, today's war in Ukraine poses a threat to international security and it is a cause of the economic crisis. A lasting peace is an overriding value. Therefore, solidarity is needed to get through this difficult time. However, there is a problem with European solidarity today, as some large countries are pursuing their own selfish policies. The Union is also experiencing um, a crisis of values. The values which once built the community are unfortunately being abandoned. I say this above all to the EU institutions, where there is no development of democracy and free political thought. Unfortunately, an artificial balance of power is blocking the development of freedom, acting against democracy, as the will of many voters, up to 50%, is being rejected. Today's system is all about power at all costs and the sharing out of positions. It is a kind of hijacking of democracy. The two main forces in this parliament, the EPP and the Socialists, although they theoretically have different agendas, have for years joined together immediately after the elections to prevent the entry of a third force. And this way they do not have to deliver on their programs. The Socialists promise social programs but fail to deliver them. They promise to look after the poorest but support CO2 trading, which drives up prices and makes people poorer. In contrast, the EPP declares that it cares about Christian values, but does not defend life from conception to natural death, does not protect marriage understood as the union of a man and a woman, and often supports gender ideology, which has nothing to do with true Christian democracy. In addition, both forces are imposing an EU, an, are imposing an EU federation, which is destroying the Europe of homelands, which its founders, Schumann and others, imagined. Unfortunately, this um, artificial political arrangement blocks free thought and ideas. The EPP's arrangement with the Socialists does not allow for any alternative, a so-called third force. Such a system fosters the political corruption we witness in the EP. This pernicious and undemocratic practice is also transferred to the level of the member states. Even our president, Gitanas Nauseda, is being attacked and his election undermined although he received 67% of the votes. This is not conducive to democracy. Europe is becoming, through the EPP Socialist Pact, an ideological vacuum. It's in disarray. Therefore, in the name of true European solidarity, a third or fourth force is needed to heal Europe, to restore its true force based on its roots. The ECR is the force that recognizes this and wants to change the situation, as we recently discussed at the summits in Warsaw and Madrid. We also talked about the need to strengthen Europe's energy independence and to develop its own industry, including heavy industry and defense. In line with this, th this thought, today we would not have problems with our defense in times of aggression in Europe. Europe and the Union need more democracy and freedom based on Christian values, a traditional family and free thought, because that is the true soul of Europe. Of the ID group to Jack Madison. Thank you so much, Madam President. Uh, Mr. Nauzer, the President of Lithuania. Uh, first of all, I'm more than happy to be here as from one from the Baltic States, from Estonia. And I really appreciate your several statements that Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania has been together in history in the good and also in the bad times. If we just remind the history, it was pretty easy for Russia, they called at this time Soviet Union, but it was Russia, the same thing. It was pretty easy to break down each country one by one 
because all those three countries, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, had their own some kind of policy. Uh, for Moscow, it wasn't very hard to have some kind of deals each by each, and the result we know pretty well. And it's just experience for the history. If you try to make some kind of deals with a Satan, you are the loser in the beginning. There is no chance. To remind some kind of necessary of the support to Ukraine, we all agree, most of us agree here. And there is a different kind of ways to help Ukraine, but the most necessary definitely is military aid. As we can see in the news, the next weeks and the next months will be very crucial in Ukraine because the both sides hasn't won. And if somebody saying that there is no winner in the war, there is. The winner can be only Ukraine, because if they lose, we will be the next ones. And there is no question about that. As I look just on the statistics, the resources, statista.com, those three Baltic states have given the biggest military and financial aid to Ukraine. Estonia with 1%, Latvia with 0.98%, Lithuania with 0.65% of the GDP, and the fourth one is Poland with 0.63%. On the same time, there has been very huge help from the US and from the UK, but they can do more. And the problem for us now is that we really don't have a lot yet to really give to Ukraine. But there are much more to keep from the US, from the UK, also from Germany and France. Germany has given 0.17% of the GDP. France, 0.07% of the GDP. Those are just cold facts and numbers. And now the question is that, are they really brave to make this change in the war or not? Because if we will lose this momentum now in the next months, we will face the new war in the next two or three years. So this is just the moment to think which kind of chances we have. If somebody is talking about the peace negotiations, the peace can be only if the conditions are good for us. And the only conditions that are good for us can be that there is no ambitions for Russia to start any kind of aggression in the next decades. I will not say forever. I'm, we shouldn't be like very naive. Uh, Russia will not disappear, but the only thing what we can do is just to weaken them as much as possible and to show that they can't win their neighbors. And uh, finally, I would like to really thank you that Lithuania was one of the countries two years ago who showed how to deal with uh, illegal migration. There is no question that if you are the war refugee, you need help. There is no doubt. But what we saw in Belarus, it was just illegal migration, what was used by Belarus for the hybrid attacks. And Lithuania, together with Poland, just shut down the border and said there is no way to enter to the European countries through those countries illegally. Because if you open the border, there will be no ending. No ending at all. Thank you. And you did absolutely well. So, Lava Achu, thank you so much and good luck for the Baltic cooperation. Thank you, Mr. Madison. I give the floor now to Dimitrios Papadimoulis on behalf of the left group. Vice President, you have the floor. Mr. President of... President, Mr. Nauseda, I would like to welcome you to the European Parliament. All political groups uh, have expressed our clear, absolute um, condemnation of uh, the Russian invasion in Lithuania, in um, Ukraine, excuse me. And your presence here today is an opportunity for us to discuss the future of the European Union, what it is that we have to do so that the European Union will stop aging. We don't want the European Union's role to be weaker. We want the European Union to be more effective in order to address the challenges and what our citizens want. In order to achieve all that, we need a European Union that will not only be a common market and a little bit of a political union. We need 
a strong European budget, not only 1% of the European GDP. We need more own resources. We need more money in order to reduce social inequalities, in order to support poorer countries and poorer categories of the population. We want to implement the European Green Deal. The European Union must remain a project for peace and democracy because democracy suffers inside the European Union as well, in Poland, in Hungary, unfortunately in my country as well, in Greece. President, I believe you are not satisfied about democracy being at its best in Lithuania either. So we must respect the rule of law and we must avoid uh, the risk of um, paralysis in Council, because in the Council, unanimity becomes a weapon in the hands of governments who want to blackmail others in order to achieve something in their own interest. Concerning enlargement, we have to be honest. We should not promise to the peoples of Moldova Georgia or the Ukraine, something that needs many years, many changes, and many conditions. Enlargement with uh, the Western Balkan countries was decided in Thessaloniki in 2003, and 20 years later, the Western Balkans are waiting for the European Union to implement their commitments. And, of course, these countries need to make the necessary reforms. We should not repeat the same mistake and promise something that we cannot implement. Thank you. Nicola Bé. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam President. President, dear colleagues, last Friday in Washington, Ursula von der Leyen uh, visited uh, Joe Biden. Without a mandate from the Council, the President of the Commission announced our full alignment with U.S. interests. It sacrificed our automotive industry and promised an agreement on rare uh, earths. And without any control, she uh, went along with a, a dangerous U.S. strategy of tension with China. Of course, there are historic ties with the U.S., but uh, NATO is a defensive alliance but vital geopolitical uh, trade interests cannot uh, be uh, aligned with Washington's. We have a war at our doors in Ukraine. We need to make sure that we have economic competitiveness, and that is our main concern. Ursula von der Leyen is pursuing a personal agenda in the hope uh, to become Secretary General of NATO in future. But Europe and its nations need to stand together and find their voice of strength, which is the only way of guaranteeing independence. Uh, the Council therefore needs to put Ursula von der Leyen in her place and needs to defend, above all, the interests of our own continent. The floor to Paolo Rangel. Thank you, President. Mr. President Nalcedas, uh, Commissioner. I remember that in the late 70s, my father, with a map in his hand, taught me, my brother and my sister, that Baltic states were not Soviet Union. They were occupied and they remained independent. And I remember that in 87, our Prime Minister from our party, Kavak Silva, that was Prime Minister 10 years and President of the Republic 10 years, in 87, he had a huge conflict with the Parliament because he didn't agree with a visit to Soviet Union where the territories of Baltic states were included and the government fell down because he was defending this principle. So I have to tell you that during decades we were in the European Union defending the sovereignty and the uh, future of democracy and freedom to Lithuania, Latvia and uh, Estonia. And today, Mr. President, we are very proud because your country became the, a world front runner of defense, of democracy, of freedom, of human rights. This was clear when you 
sent all the support to the Ukrainian people. But also when you are claiming for democracy in Belarus, and when you are saying that you don't accept the blackmail of China. The example of the Ukrainian solidarity, I have to say, shows that you want for other countries in Europe, and are you dare to say in the world, the same fate that Lithuania had that was in a very, very oppressive regime and managed to become independent and to give freedom, prosperity and human rights respect to all the citizens. And so I would like to thank you, to say, ask you, Mr. President, to all the Lithuanian people and also to you and to your government. And let me try to invite you to, hear, to have here your view or your say on the protest for Belarus and how should we shape our relation with China. Because the Lithuanian experience is a very important one and can set the example to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rangel. I give the floor now to Dominic Ruiz de Vesa. Thanks very much, Madam President, and welcome, of course, to the President of the Republic of Lithuania, President Nausidas. I completely agree with what you said in your speech. Your ideas of being tough when it came to Russia, complete support for Ukraine in the defence of its territorial integrity and sovereignty, also the opening up of possibility of enlargement for Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova and the Western Balkans. I completely support this agenda. At the same time, I would like to say that this agenda will, if we're honest, if we're going to be credible, this agenda also needs to mention something you didn't mention, the deepening of the political project in Europe. It should be clear, and I'm speaking as a spokesman for my group when it comes to constitutional issues, that there can't be enlargement without deepening. We need to, we can't have a council of foreign affairs with 29, 32 members, which requires unanimity to adopt the MFF with 33 member states and 33 national ratifications as well. So, Mr. President, I would urge you to contribute to the debate in the Council to open the way to uh, voting on a new treaty which is more democratic, more effective and therefore more federal. Mr. Ruiz de Vesa, I give the floor now to Marie-Pierre Vedren. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, President, uh, Commissioners, one needs courage to support unconditionally the Ukrainian people, as Lithuania has always done. And you need courage to open your borders to uh, protect those who fled Lukashenko's dictatorial regime. You need courage in the face of expansionist, an expansionist Russian neighbor, and you need courage uh, to uh, head of uh, Chinese interests. And you need courage to not turn your back uh, on your allies. And Lithuania has had this courage. Your population uh, uh, is testimony to that. And there are some who fail to see that national sovereignty is reinforced by European solidarity. Your country uh, goes uh, to show what some of us reject, which is that greater uh, European uh, integration uh, is to protect our values. Yes, the European Union needs to stand united, and that's why, and you said this yourself, uh, an, uh, a reactive instrument which is effective is needed and should not be uh, blocked by one country. It's imperative that that is no longer possible. We need to be able uh, to react and protect ourselves when third countries seek to limit our freedom. President, your country uh, and uh, the Lithuanians uh, have shown uh, to Europe that the only way to defend democracy and today's challenges uh, is to do what you've done. Faced by a, a pandemic, we've acted. Uh, group purchases uh, of vaccines, the recovery facility, 
but there's also been the unjustified uh, invasion uh, of Ukraine. And we've acted sanctions, aid, uh, weapons supply. There's been the energy crisis, and we continue to uh, react as Europeans. New uh, supply lines, investment in uh, green uh, and renewable energy sources. Now, we need to continue to act as Europeans and uh, stave off uh, the uh, sirens of division. We need to reinforce the dialogue between our countries and also with third countries. We need to continue to act as sovereign uh, Europeans who show solidarity. We need to uh, feed our citizens and face up to the challenge of climate change, and we should leave no one behind. In order to achieve this, we need to enter into dialogue and act together. We in Parliament stand ready to do this, to take uh, your way, the way of your people, to make sure that these reactions and actions are not without reply and that collectively we uh, uh, can meet uh, the expectations of all Europeans. And uh, Mr. President, uh, Nicolas Bay, my colleague, who's already left the hemicycle, uh, said nothing about your country. But please uh, rest assured that Rassemble National and the extremists uh, will never win the day. Thank you. Vedren, I give the floor now to Bronis Rope. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Your Excellency, Commissioners, dear colleagues. President, I would like to say a sincere thank you for your contribution and your continuous efforts in order to provide uh, the necessary uh, assistance to Ukraine. You went to Ukraine on the eve of this war and met um, its uh, president. You did not heed the words of uh, the heads of other countries. You said that we had to provide all the necessary assistance to Ukraine. And I say a sincere thank you to you. But I would like to see more active political, your more active political participation in dealing with Lithuania's internal problems, such as huge inflation, rising food prices, um, increasing interest rates. Uh, some families are finding it hard uh, to, uh, to live. I also would like to mention the crisis in our dairy sector and uh, the complicated future of our agriculture. Uh, we are not satisfied with the uh, national politics in various regions of Lithuania, since there is a huge gap between uh, the level of living in uh, rural areas and in towns. I understand that the war in Ukraine has, has uh, widened all these problems. However, it would, be, it would not be correct to start doubting now. We need to take the course of action in order to ensure a better uh, level of living for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rope. Next is Richard Czarnecki. Madam President, uh, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, it was a very important speech, and I regret uh, that uh, there are so few of us here, about uh, 60 MEPs, so less than 10 percent of the European Parliament listened to this speech because it's really worth listening to the voice of uh, Lithuania, of uh, the Baltic states of our region. I regret, but that's the reality. I am glad that we are meeting here again because uh, Mr. President uh, um, joined us in Poland during our uh, national holiday. It was a very important visit. Uh, but uh, I was thinking about what you will say today, Mr. President. And uh, I think uh, I guessed correctly. Uh, and I guessed correctly because I knew you would be talking about Ukraine, and thank you for this. You will be talking about history, and you will want to show Lithuania as the country which is a part of this European mainstream. And I remember very well when Seimas, the Lithuanian parliament, was the only one and the first one which voted unanimously to uh, adopt a European constitution, which was later rejected in referenda by uh, the Netherlands and France. 
However, I think that sometimes it's worth discussing things, uh, even arguing when it comes to Europe, because uh, from these arguments we can have uh, decisions which will later be very positive for the EU. And at the end, I want to say that I believe that you will uh, support also Polish minority in Lithuania because this uh, pluralism and uh, support for minorities is absolutely fundamental. Thank you, Achu. For now, to Joao Pimenta Lopes. Mr. President, once again, we've got a speech talking about war without looking at any other way of solving problems. People are in more and more dire straits as we see production being centralised, low salaries, more precarious work, and the European Union is still failing to provide any solutions. These are measures which are just going to increase poverty and concentrate wealth in fewer and fewer hands. There's a huge increase in the cost of living, and what we need to do is put an end to the speculation of big economic groups and their obscene profits. We need investment in public sectors and show solidarity in providing social assistance for people who need it. We need to stop exploitation and the precarious nature of people's jobs. The, all these things need, are needed in Europe, and Europe is continuing to refuse to provide them. People are getting fed up. They are mobilising at work, and they're going to demand the right to a job with a higher salary and more rights. They want an end to exploitation. They want market, markets to be regulated and maximum prices to be put into place. They want peace. This is the voice which you need to be listening to. Thank you. Well, now to Sven Simon. For President in Madam President, Mr. President, you have said, with violence and lies, what will destroy what we find valuable in Europe. And that is true. Ladies and gentlemen, this brutal war of aggression against Ukraine has brought two points of recognition to us, that we have to rely on one another, for defense in the NATO and our defense union is more important than ever. And secondly, with energy supply, we depend on one another. And Germany, as it already has mentioned, would have been well advised in past years to uh, listen to what Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania had said and follow that advice. And earlier in Germany, we said the future of the Baltic countries is in Europe. And today we say, and I say this as a German member, looking at defense, at energy, but above all, Mr. President, this very clear orientation you've given us means that I can say the future orientation of Europe should be in the Baltic. And the spirit of the Baltic way should be leading Europe. And I would like to agree with you for saying that. In fact, indeed, when we talk about the future of Europe, then people express concerns that future steps towards European integration would mean uh, less influence from the smaller countries. But I think the Baltic way demonstrates the opposite is true. Together, common decisions, European decisions, can prevent us from going on a single path as individuals. And I think we're talking, standing now at a threshold and if we look at our defense capabilities, when we speak of those, they should no longer uh, be dependent on who happens to be in the White House. We're in front of important steps that we need to take where we can only give one unified European answer. Energy, defense, you've mentioned another, other topics. And Jean-Claude Juncker once said that we have two kinds of member states. Uh, we, have two, we have small countries and countries who know they're small countries. And I think it's important to re 
re recall that as a small country, you can behave as a really great country. And I think as a small member state, then a member can actually become something great. And I'm very, I'm very proud that Mrs. Metzola has come from a small country, yet is elected to president. So a small country can be quite great indeed. Thank you very much. Come on, I give the floor now to Lesek Miller. Mr. President, Madam President, dear colleagues, in a month, on the 16th of April, it will be the 20th anniversary of signing by the governments of Poland and Lithuania in Athens of the Accession Treaty, which was the legal basis for our accession into the EU. Eight other countries did the same back then, and it was the largest um, enlargement in the history of the EU. I had the honor as the Polish Prime Minister to sign that treaty. And both in Poland and in Lithuania, I'm sure this 20th anniversary will be an opportunity to sum up the years of our membership. Mr. President, I'm sure that you have a very positive view of these 20 years of us being in the EU, just like myself and many Poles. However, not only history is important, what is important is the discussion about the future of Europe, upholding the ideas that keep us together. This idea was embodied in the support for Ukraine that is facing Russian aggression, but also in the respect of European values, the rule of law, social justice, the equality of men and women, support for everyone who needs it and expects it. We are able to renew ourselves, to build bridges. This is the right path, and we need to continue along that path, thinking about the future generations. We need to be even more integrated in the EU, and we need to respect all the values due to which we have gathered here Altogether, I am convinced that both Lithuania and all the other member states will be following that path. Thank you. For one minute. Dear Chair and dear President uh, Noseda, very welcome to our house. And you refer to summer 21 when Lukashenko brutally instrumentalized migrants by sending them to your border. The EU stood behind your country as it was an attack on the EU and also an attack on our values. But the only right response is a value-based one. The Court of Justice last summer was crystal clear. Lithuania's legislation allowing for pushbacks, automatic detention and denial of the right to asylum is illegal under EU law. And despite this, your government approved the bill further legalizing these illegal policies. And we hear your government justify these violations under the misguided arguments of fighting instrumentalization. But what you do is fighting innocent victims in need of protection. So I urge you to stop these pushbacks and arbitrary detentions and to adjust the legislation in line with the Court of Justice ruling. Don't turn away refugees at the border, but turn away from unlawful policies. Restore the rule of law at the EU's borders. Defend EU values, and we will stand with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Strick. I give the floor now to Carlo Ressler for two minutes. Thank you, President. President, uh, colleagues, together with our Baltic neighbors, uh, Lithuania, Ukraine, but also Croatia, my country has uh, fought against repression, has fought for freedom, has tried to preserve its identity, its language and its culture. All of this, while our freedom was not taken for granted, it was contested by many, especially by stronger and larger neighbors. 
Croatia and Ukraine have suffered aggression. Croatia managed to defend itself, to free itself, and we know very well what Ukraine is going through. Years of well-prepared aggression, uh, strong propaganda, but also well-orchestrated internal rebellion. This is something uh, that Ukraine is now living through, and Croatia has, the, has this in its past. M maybe the same was being prepared prepared for the Baltic states as well. The Baltic states have felt uh, the impact of misinformation in the past decade. They felt impact on its digital infrastructure. Ukraine suffers many attacks on its civil, civilian infrastructure. Croatia is far from any military danger at this moment, but still uh, we have many cultural attacks. Um, going on. Although we are quite different and we are at different moments in history, we have one thing in common. We know who we are, we know what our values are, and we know where we belong. And for these reasons, it is most important that every corner of Europe, regardless of um, how far we feel we are from any kind of a war or any kind of front, uh, it is important to know that it is our future that is being decided in Ukraine today. Floor to Isabel Santos now. And can I please ask the colleagues who are coming into the room now to keep it quiet? Isabel, go ahead. Mr. President Nauseda, let me begin by expressing my recognition for the brave, determined way that Lithuania has stood up for European values in the face of autocratic regimes, not just Putin and Lukashenko, but also other forces. It's an example for many countries in the European Union. But I would say that I have been in Lithuania and I've seen the unpleasant conditions that immigrants from Africa and the Middle East have been subjected to, having been used by Lukashenko as weapons. A lot of these people have been freed and the conditions have improved. We're aware of that. But Médecins Sans Frontières have been forced to abandon their operations there because of restrictions imposed upon them. And in 2022, more than 8,000 Uzbeks have been sent to the Lithuanian border as well, who are continuing to appear. So, Mr. President, violations of human rights, uh, violations of international law, can't be combated with more human rights violations of international or European law. I'm sure that you will show the same level of humanity that you've shown to those refugees from Ukraine. Now to Mr. Olekas. Once again, I ask the colleagues, please, to keep it quiet once they come into the room. Thank you, Chairman, President, dear colleagues. I am proud to be a representative of Lithuania. President, you mentioned our glorious history, but I'd like to focus on the last years, 18 years since we are members of the EU. The move forward has been gigantic uh, in terms of GDP. It's almost at the level of the EU average. We are full-fledged members of the EU and NATO. Uh, we faced a lot of challenges during the last years. Uh, COVID-19, the stolen election by the Belarusian uh, dictator, and last but not least, the Russian war against Ukraine. Your Excellency, I would like to thank you for your personal efforts for consolidating the support to Ukraine. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Lithuanian people who have uh, received a lot of refugees from Ukraine. We are facing discussions today, and I fully agree with you that the only guarantee for peace is kicking out the occupants, uh, occupiers from Ukraine and the special tribunal for the criminals, as well as a full-fledged membership for Ukraine in the European Union. You mentioned not only the Russian dicta dictator, but also the Belarusian one. 
almost uh, 1,500 political prisoners are in Belarus in inhuman conditions. And therefore, I'd like to request the European Council, together with the European Parliament, encouragement, do everything that those political prisoners be released, including Kolesnikova, Statkevich, Belatsky, and others, in spite of the economic crisis sparked off by the Russian aggression and uh, thanks to the resilience and despite the resilience of our citizens, we can see that some of, uh, some of the sectors are profiting from the crisis, such as the banking sector, the pharma sector, and these excessive and the energy says, uh, and these excessive profits should be reined in. We are also seeing the importance of securing food security. And it is high time to ensure that the European farmers receive equal support and uh, that the direct payments reach the farmers in the Baltic countries, that we have a just and social Europe. The is yours to answer the questions, the varying uh, arguments, points that have been made over the past hour. The floor is yours. Welcome again. First of all, I would like to react to some comments made by the colleagues, uh, you parliamentary members from Lithuania. For example, Mr. Tomaszewski has regretted that I am attacked by some political parties in Lithuania, even after the elections where I, where I collected 67% of votes. You know, I am new man in the politics. I uh, went to the politics in 2019. I was elected as a president, as an independent candidate, the president of Lithuania. But one issue I realized being in the politics, that the politics is not just peaceful and uh, coexistence with the political parties. This is a fight. This is a competition. And this is not a competition for my own interest, but it's a competition for the ideas I present. And but one of the main priorities, I went to the politics, and but my program was dedicated to the pro, uh, social welfare state idea. And even in being in this competition, with, uh, sometimes with opposition, sometimes with ruling coalition, we were able to implement some very important measures which will make the life of some sensitive and uh, exposable uh, groups of society better. Uh, first of all, the pensioners, uh, socially, socially affected uh, families, and so on, and so on. Now, uh, some comments on migration. I would like to touch the issue of migration because this is very important. We have two kinds of migration. Migration which is caused by just spontaneous movements of the people from the countries where there are some social problems, those countries are in the stage of war. And this second kind of migration, we call it instrumentalized migration. And we face this phenomena in 2020. Uh, People just became the weapons in the hands of some totalitarian leaders uh, which uh, are near to us, for example, Mr. Lukashenko. And he used deliberately this kind of migration, just trying to destabilize the situation in my country and in European Union. What we need in this situation? We need very clear legal framework in order to deal with, the, with this kind of challenges. If we will not have it, just we will put the, uh, the instruments into the hands of, of Lukashenko or Putin to attack us, to destabilize us, and this is not good. So this is the reason why we ask European Parliament, we ask uh, European Commission, to provide this kind of legal framework in order to be more efficient and to, in order to be 
more successful in fighting illegal migration. Of course, not, this is not only one issue. There are uh, many other issues, and we have, we have to strengthen our uh, strategic communication. We have uh, to help uh, these people uh, which returned to the origin countries uh, to be reintegrated into the society, and we have much to be much more active in the countries uh, of uh, origin of migration and transit of migration. Now about Ukraine. Why Lithuania is taking the lead in providing the support to Ukraine? I can explain it by telling you some historic facts. There was a time, 14, 15, 16th century, as we were in the same Commonwealth, Commonwealth of Lithuanians, coexisting uh, uh, with uh, 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 Belarusians and Ukrainians. And it was very peaceful formation of the countries, one uh, common body of countries, and uh, there was full respect of the nations to each other. Even the nations which belong to different language groups, they have very different traditions, and you know, these kind of feelings, we remember, lead to the empathy to Ukraine. We treat them like the brothers and sisters. They are our brothers and sisters. The second reason, Lithuania as never one else, probably, uh, maybe uh, Baltic countries and Poland, putting them uh, together, understands that the fight in the battle, on the battlefields in Ukraine is a freedom fight, but not only the freedom fight of Ukrainians. This is our freedom fight. Because as my colleague, I think, from Estonia mentioned, the second target will be Baltic countries, Poland, maybe Romania, and there will be third target. If Putin will be not stopped in Ukraine, there will be next targets. We have to be fully aware of it. China. Yes, Lithuania had some interesting, challenging story, history of relations with China. Several years ago, we decided to leave so-called format of 17 plus 1 because we realized that this format is not any uh, any much promising to us and implementing uh, very important infrastructure projects and so on and so on. And we decided to leave it and we uh, still defend the idea that we have to speak with China one voice. So 27 countries plus one would be best suitable format in communication and relations with China. Some other countries uh, followed our example, and now this format is already 13 or 14 plus one. And I think that sooner or later, we will uh, come to the conclusion that the best way uh, uh, to deal with China is just 27 plus one. Uh, enlargement of European Union. This is very important, and we are keen proponent of enlargement of Europe. We uh, defend the right of our nations uh, to join European Union sooner or later. So this is the reason why we support the aspirations of Moldova, aspirations of Ukraine, aspirations of Georgia, because we remember very well what the trigger, powerful trigger of uh, progress was our membership in European Union. As we entered the European Union, we started from 43% of GDP per capita. Now we already reached 86% of GDP per capita. And we are running forward uh, with uh, excellent speed. So this is a huge opportunity to be European, but this is also responsibility. To be European means responsibility. To be sensible, to be united and to help the countries in need. And this country in need is now Ukraine. So we have to 
understand and remember it very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. The sitting will resume in approximately one minute where we start with the votes. So, going to the votes, we start with the report by uh, Mr. Halitsky. Before we start with the report by Mr. Halitsky, dear colleague, you want to make a point of order? Go ahead.